All right, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be um, too offended by that. <laughs> um, but we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, um, both our live show here on Wednesday mornings or our recordings, which are all available on our website if you're not able to join us here on Wednesdays. Um, we go live on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Central Time. And then um, all of our recordings going back to the very first one, which is in January 2009, are all available on our website for you to watch if you want to. Um, and we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, basically anything that would be of interest to librarians, um, we'll, we're happy to have it on the show. And we do have commission, Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations, and we do have guest speakers sometimes, and today we have a mixture of that. Um, we have um, next to me here, to my left, is um, Mary Jo Ryan, who's here from the Nebraska Library Commission. Hello. And across from me is uh, Rod Wagner, also from the Library Commission. And then in the middle <laughs> is our guest for this morning, um, uh, Tyla Hansen, who is our new state poet, new as of last year, really, so not brand new, November. but November, okay. Um, and we're going to be chatting with uh, her this morning about the whole program and how it's all going and what, um, how libraries can... Uh, get involved. So I'm going to hand over to you guys to take over and uh, thank you Krista. There you go. Well to start things off uh, it's it's a very special uh, honor for us to have Nebraska State Poet Twyla Hansen with us uh, today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a few preliminaries uh, it was on November 14 last year when Governor Heineman announced uh, Twyla's appointment as Nebraska State Poet for a three-year term, excuse me, five-year term. <laughs> I was looking at the three on 2013. Five-year term beginning uh, December 1, 2013. Um, that uh, announcement, uh, I'm sure, was followed by a lot of activity on Twyla's part to <laughs> put into motion uh, various activities as Nebraska State Poet. Um, another very special event came up in January, January 13, when a um, very special event was held at the Capitol right. to introduce Twyla. Uh, First Lady of Nebraska, Sally Ganim, introduced uh, Twyla on that day as the uh, Nebraska State Poet. It was also uh, an opportunity to congratulate, to welcome, to honor uh, also the uh, uh, candidates who were uh, also considered for uh, the appointment. But as I recall, that was a very full room that afternoon. It was a lot of fun. Standing room only. Standing room only <laughs> yes, is ab absolutely yes, right. Amazing. Yeah, it was great. And that's a pretty large room, so uh, that was fun. I want to uh, give some very special recognition to uh, colleagues with the Nebraska Arts Council and Humanities Nebraska who provided some really uh, great leadership in uh, bringing the process together that um, led to Twyla's appointment. And uh, that happened uh, many months ago and um, involved the uh, Nebraska Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska, and, and Nebraska Library Commission uh, as three organizations working together with the governor's office to uh, carry out a process uh, that involved also the uh, recruitment and appointment of a selection committee to uh, consider nominations uh, to uh, meet with um, people who were uh, selected as candidates for the appointment and so forth. So uh, a big thank you to for some very great work on their part. Um, Twyla is the uh, third essentially uh, state poet uh, John G. Neihart was uh, the Poet Laureate, appointed back in 1921, uh, and he served in that capacity for many years. Later, uh, the process was changed, and Governor Thone uh, 
appointed Bill Clefcorn to serve as Nebraska State poet, and he did so uh, for many years until his death a few years ago. And um, following uh, Mr. Clefcorn's uh, death, uh, there was a gap. We didn't have a state poet for a while, and then the process was uh, launched to, that led to uh, Twyla's appointment. So, um, so here we are. that's where we are, <laughs> in brief. <laughs> well, Twyla, maybe you could uh, give us a few ideas about what's been happening since this all began, and how this has been for you, and some experiences you've had. Well, it's been, um, it's settling down a little bit now um, in May, but uh, at the beginning there was just a flurry of activity, um, social, not social media, but media attention, radio, filming, interviews, um, calls, uh, for information and or, you know, over the phone kind of things. And um, lots of, um, there was a, an article in the Lincoln Journal Star, for example. I was interviewed by the Omaha World Herald and my hometown newspaper, Lions Mirror Sun. And, and so there just was a lot of media attention. Um, Elle Magazine from Journal Star. Nebraska Wesleyan Archways Magazine, and the latest is Nebraska Life um, Magazine did an article. So it literally, it's just been a flurry of activity there. That has settled down some. Um, I've had lots of invitations to speak to groups, which is great. Um, this is something I've been doing for a couple of decades now, is uh, giving workshops and readings through Humanities Nebraska. And I've recently added a program through the Nebraska Arts Council. So I have two programs, essentially. One is a workshop, and the other is a reading discussion. And um, those, um, we will show you the websites for those in a little bit. Um, I've also, I've started a Facebook page um, for the State Poet. And you can find that by just typing in Twyla Hansen, Nebraska State Poet, and you'll get it. It'll come up. I started that December 1st, and I have um, well over 650 followers, which is awesome. And I try to post things that are relevant to writers, especially poets, on there. And like during uh, National Poetry Month, I featured uh, poets who were going to be presenting at the book festival, for example, at the end of April. So that was a lot of fun, and I still find websites or publications or events that people might be interested in. I've posted my schedule on there and, and so it's just you can go there. I I'm not don't really have an active website. I do have a website through Humanities Nebraska, but um, really the social media is where I'm posting most of my stuff. So that's been happening. Um, and I have some plans for the future, if you want to talk about that. Um, I am hoping to get a website um, through the university. This is still in the works um, for access to, to Nebraska poets and Nebraska poetry. But I would have to work through them. And this is all very preliminary, but the um, director is um, in favor of this. So that's a good sign. That's a great idea. <laughs> And uh, so we, there's going to be some collaboration from a lot of people on this. But um, to do a real website in their mode will take a couple of years. So I'm hoping by, like in three years from now, we'll have an active website that um, people across the state or anywhere really can access um, current and past Nebraska writers. Uh, we'll start with poetry. But it's in conjunction with the Nebraska State Poet kind of thing. Oh, that's great. So. And, and when you were talking about the programs, um, these are things that schools and libraries can um, apply to have, have you funded to come right. out and do a program in the school or in the library. That's right. That's right. I've gone to, I've, for uh, 20 years, over 20 years, I've done readings and workshops in schools, libraries, and community groups all across the state. I mean, I've been, you know, from Shadroom down to um, 
Peru State College and uh, everywhere in between and all over the state. I really have traveled the state already. And with all sorts of different age groups, elementary, yes. uh, secondary, adults. Absolutely. Um, the schools, mostly it would be middle school. Although a friend of mine, um, we went to Loomis Public Schools and we, in two days, we had every grade. Wow. In our wow. Class. We brought them in in groups. It was a lot of fun. Um, and it really shows that poetry speaks to every age. Right. And I did this with a fiction writer, Karen Shoemaker, my friend. So um, at that point, we were, um, we were able to get into more schools, and that was exciting. Um, not so much all that recently, but libraries are a source that I really would like to tap into. Mm -hmm. Um, because in one case I went to Lexington last two years ago maybe and they brought in a couple of high schools, Lexington and another school. So it was a high school workshop and the room was filled. We had like 50, 60 students in there. Wow. And I conducted a workshop there. How do, how do uh, those librarians, uh, libraries uh, get in touch with you to ask you about uh, some type of an event. Right. right. Well, um, on Humanities Nebraska, and I believe in Nebraska Arts Council, my phone, home phone number is published, okay. and so it's a public kind of thing. Right. Um, but they could also contact me through um, email. Mm -hmm. And the way it works is they have to contact me first with their event and make sure I'm available and willing to do it. It's not required. My only requirements are that I promote and encourage appreciation of poetry and literature in Nebraska, and also to encourage the emerging um, generation of writers. So going to the schools and working with, um, with young people is really ideal mm -hmm. for this position. So, and so if a, like say a library's got an event coming up and they think this would make a great program for it, they would first contact you to mm -hmm. let you know when the event is and just to check your schedule and right. see if you're able. Right. And then they look into, after talking to you, that you might have a suggestion as to whether they would look into Humanities Nebraska funding or the Arts Council right. of Nebraska Touring yeah. Program funding, just depending right. on the conversation. Right, depending on what they have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, they all they have to be, I believe, either a school or a nonprofit group mm -hmm. so, um, to, in order to get that kind of funding. Mm -hmm. I've done lots of um, readings and things that were not funded by them. Um, in the past and now, especially, the people have their own funding. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a negotiation process. And I think libraries are used to this because they've, uh, a lot of libraries have applied for these Humanities Nebraska uh, Speakers Bureau mm -hmm. um, events, but maybe they haven't um, done anything with the touring program from the Arts Council, so yeah. it's good to call Twyla first. Yeah, thank you. Do any of you have any questions? Um, you know, as Krista mentioned, that you can type your questions in the question box, or you can type a request to have your microphone muted and talk to us, which would be even more fun. <laughs> and I just want to remind everyone, people who have been on the attended our show regularly know this, um, all the links and URLs that we're mentioning um, will be included in the show recording afterwards. Um, I'm putting them into our Delicious account as we're speaking, so um, you'll be able to get access to all of them there. Um, and any news articles I found too. I found the Omaha one. Oh, good. <laughs> one. Excellent. Yeah. To did, add to the ones we already had out there. And did you find the Lincoln Journal article? Yes. Yep. That's already beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that beautiful. Yep. Yeah. A friend of mine laminated that. <laughs> that, that was <laughs> really nice. Nice. <laughs> you don't see that nice lamination all the time, yeah. do you? <laughs> Not anymore. Did you want me to read a poem? We do want you to read a poem. I was just <laughs> going to ask you to do that. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> and this is kind of to ask answer a question that um, we had a note on where do your ideas for poems come from and literally they can come out of anything thin air um, I read a lot I get a lot of my ideas from the newspaper of all places because people do say weird things um, <laughs> And that's kind of stick in your mind, like it reminds you of something, or like science. I really, I, I have some, a science background, so I'm very interested in science. So, but anyway, it can come out anywhere. And this poem that I'm going to read you came out of a morning walk I had. And um, I started playing around with words, which is one of the name of my, one of my programs uh, in the past with humanities. 
um, we're playing around with words in this, so this comes out of that. Um, and I have an epigraph from the poet Mary Oliver, who says, you never know where a sentence will take you. Morning walk. Before sunrise, under the halogen hunter's moon, an autumn morning stretches ahead of me a rhythm. Shy stars over the city, the inky dark, the concrete path on which I pound out duty, conjure up fantasy, those old tensions. In the street, vehicles sounding their singular verb, speed. On the other side, at season's end, the syntax of wheat field, muslin consonants remaining, its vowels of harvest long gone. At times, I'd like to stick out my thumb, that potent comma, to risk all for a sentence into the unknown. Who knows where it might lead to those other lives scattering in each direction. But soon enough, a string of nouns pulls me back, keeps me moving on the straight and parallel, leads me home again, where through my wild yard at first light the quick red fox bounds, its fluffy tail the ultimate dash, the unanswered question, where gathered, gathering blackbirds as if on cue, swirl up sudden, excess ellipses peppering the sky. Wow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so that poem, literally, I started playing around with you know, words that have to do with language. It's just fun. Yeah. You know, you get caught up in it. So you make notes and you play around and you combine it with nature and there you go. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. And that's from Potato Soup. That's a collection Nebraska of... Book Award. Yeah, I was going to say that's a Nebraska mm -hmm. Book Award winner Wonder. for poetry. 2004. 2004. Mm -hmm. It's from the Backwaters Press. Uh, in working with uh, kids, uh, anything surprise you? You've done that before, of course, mm -hmm. but in your new activities as state poet. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there was a uh, group of school kids at your at the event in January, and oh, they even presented better. you a poem. Yes, the school across the street. Is that um, St. Saint, um, Saint Mary's? St. Mary's yeah. School. Uh, they had one of the classes came to the uh, celebration of the new state poet, and they presented me. Oh, I should have brought that, but it was a wonderful little booklet. Of congratulations. They had written it all out. And they said, we hope you come to our school. So I'm still waiting for that invitation. Oh. <laughs> but um, that was delightful. I was really pleased to see that group there. And, and I'm always surprised when I give workshops. Um, what I do in my workshops, I focus on process instead of product. And so we'll do spontaneous writing. And the spontaneous writing, even though some students say, oh, that isn't how I write. I don't like to write like that. I write fantasy and I don't do this or, you know, one thing or another. Um, they surprise themselves by what they can, can write out of a writing exercise. So um, surprise is something we like. <laughs> <laughs> surprise is a good thing. Yes. Um, you're part of a community of some very fine Nebraska writers. Um, how do you see your role as state poet in, in kind of promoting other Nebraska writers and writing? Right. I think that's important. And one of the things I want to do on my Facebook page is actually create greater community. So mm -hmm. um, every chance I get, I'm trying to put links to other poets, like if there's a um, for example, my friends um, Lucy Adkins and Becky Breed uh, have a publication out on writing in community. It's, that's the title of their publication. And it just won an independent publisher's award, uh, which is a national award, which is just awesome. Yeah. So um, I put that on my Facebook page. And it's, it's things like that that we need to celebrate in our state because we are there's a lot of writers, but we're uh, most of us know each other, and we learn from each other, so I think that's really important. And I see my role as a state poet to celebrate these kind of um, 
Oh, for example, I did post the uh, Young Writers Camp at the university this summer, and uh, Omaha has the Fine Lines Young Writers Camp, which is David Martin um, from Omaha has been conducting this workshop in Omaha for 15 years. Yeah. So it's an ongoing, long-time um, event. That I think those are the kind of things I want to bring together. So if you have an idea, and anyone out there listening to this broadcast has an idea of something that Twyla might want to share with that whole writing community in Nebraska, mm -hmm. just share that with Twyla. And later on in the broadcast, we'll have her email address up mm -hmm. so you can share the information, and, and she'll share it. And right, <laughs> yeah. We'll Send me a website or a um, post. Well, it has to be an image um, so or a link. Uh, they won't allow you to put um, Word documents up, but I can link to a website or I can, um, if, if you're showing that yeah. um, Facebook page right there. This um, is Twyla's Facebook page we're showing right now. You can see she linked to Nebraska Life Magazine, which right. is a link to a website. And then here's a link to a video about the Young Writing Camp. So it can be... And there's a, the silver medal winner for... Um, to Lucy and Becky. Yeah, yeah. They, they won a whippy. Ippy Award. <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, these independent are independent publishing. That's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. And so um, those are the kind of things um, that we want to get out to more people. And I think social media is the way to go because um, it it can go out kind of quickly, and I, I get a lot of views on these um, postings. So. Yeah, and comments. And comments. Yay! Yeah, that's that keeps the community discussion oh, yeah. going. Right. Yeah. That's, that's right. So, Twyla, would you like to read something else for us? Sure. I brought three of my books that are currently in. Um, they're still available. <laughs> my first three books are not um, available. They're sold out or whatever, not in circulation anymore. Although some libraries have them. I noticed, right. I, I checked to see uh, on WorldCat, and then any of you can do that too. And I know that the Heritage Room, the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors in, at Lincoln City Libraries at Bennett Martin Library, mm -hmm. they have them all. Yes, they I'm have sure all they the do. books. They do. So, so you can, there are still ways to get them. They, <laughs> they're, they're out there. They're libraries. Out. Yeah. Libraries. And um, this book is actually available online through uh, UNL Digital Commons. Um, and this is Prairie Talk or this Prairie, is, uh, Prairie Sweets. I'm Prairie sorry. Prairie Sweet. That's kind of an odd picture of it. Yeah, but um, what this is is a collaboration between me and uh, poems by me and drawings by Dr. Paul Johnsgard, who's um, an ornithologist, uh, world world renowned, world renowned. And he and I put together a collection, and uh, we donated our um, our work to uh, Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center down by Denton, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And um, so they they sell this as a fundraiser in, in their workshop or the, in their gift shop. But anyway, it was a fun collaboration because um, Dr. Johnsgard is an excellent um, artist, and he. Um, he had a lot of drawings uh, that I could that he put with my short poems, and then when I ran out of poems, I said, "Well, well, what other drawings do you have? They they all deal with tall grass prairie," and so he says, "Oh, I've got lots of drawings." So he told me some subjects, and I wrote some more poems. <laughs> so this one I'm going to read is the um, lightning bug. He had already drawn this lightning bug, but he said, "You know, you see." lightning bugs at night and he says so I made at night uh -huh. lots of ink <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was a delight to work with and this is so, called I was going to ask before you read um, the, you mentioned the digital commons that this book is in UNL digital commons um, Krista we'll put that in the delicious yep I just app. found yeah I did I just found it yeah I went looking for it <laughs> um, so right. yeah that's the link directly to this online is in will be in the notes right. afterwards too and yep. it's it's the um, is it a Similarly in the book, or is it? I found a PDF. PDF. Actually, it's PDF. It is. Yeah, it's a PDF of the of it, um, just exactly as that, but just in as a PDF. Right. With the drawings and, mm -hmm. the, and yeah. the poetry. Yeah. Oh, and I have two 
two of my out of print books are on there too. Oh. Um, if you just type my name in, that mm. one's under John's Guard, but um, I have my own page, I guess. <laughs> okay, I'll read this poem called Lightning Bugs. What better show for mortal mortals bursting with rivers of free light, playing out above the darkened grass? Night opens the blue folds of its silk. Like stars blinking, they row awake. Countless beetles, their abdomens brimming with luminescence, out from under snags and black leaves, into the brief and cinnamon air. Over pond and blade, in their appetite, they bring us fire, restoring a spark of salvation to our crumpled lives. These mysterious gatherers, these silent signalers, these copious lightning bugs of childhood delight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we all remember the first time, or maybe the few times in your childhood, where we collected them, put them in mason jars. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. I think everyone did. Treasure. <laughs> And if you're from California, you come back to Nebraska just to do that. I don't think they have lightning bugs. They don't. No, they don't. No, it's too dry. They yeah, too not. dry. They do not get that opportunity until they come visit Aunt Mary Jo in Nebraska. That's right. <laughs> they don't have cardinals either. They are not over on the other side of the mountains, I guess. Isn't that interesting? Right. That is interesting. But you would know that with your background. <laughs> yes. yes. You can probably tell us lots about the plants we have here that we're so fortunate to have that they don't have, too. Yeah, plants creep into my writing for some I reason. Bet. <laughs> I bet. You'll have to read us one that has, okay. that with the plants creeping in. <laughs> Actually, I see in the digital comments, and I was looking you up, as you said, that there's things here about organic farming. Right. That, yeah, from your other... Uh, the other Your previous thing. slide. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. My background, my education background is in horticulture and um, sustainable agriculture. So, and I've had work experience in both of those, uh, including a long-term stint at Nebraska Wesleyan University. So. Have you done any uh, collaborations with uh, Benjamin Vogt, given his... Uh, I haven't. I haven't, so but forth? you're right. That he's, would be a great... Uh, he's, um, he's on my radar. Very much. So. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yep. Very serious advocate for native plants, which I am too. So, um, let's see what what else are we going to talk about here? Well, of course, one of the things that we wanted to really um, highlight is the role of the the uh, state poet in inspiring an emerging generation of new writers. Right. And the the writing workshops, those that's mm -hmm. one way of doing that. Have you thought mm -hmm. of other kinds of ideas about that? Well. Um, when we have, at some point when we have a website where it, it might become interactive even, um, mm -hmm. where we would have access to current writers, or, uh, I'm hoping to do some kind of, um, call it a webinar, I don't know, some kind of, you know, this is a big state, and to travel, for one person to travel to the other end of the state is, is a long way, is it? Yeah. But, if it could be some kind of a, a, a media like this where you could tape it and maybe they could show it when it was convenient for them. or mm -hmm. I'm interested in that kind of thing. And so, But I want to pursue this other, um, I'm slowly pursuing it. Let's put it this way. When you work with a lot of other people, it takes time. <laughs> sure, yeah. And so um, I'm starting with this one where we, we're going to have a pilot project, I hope, of five Nebraska writers in, from each of the kind of regions in Nebraska. Start with that and see how that goes. And um, I'm talking about this all very pre preliminary at this yeah. point, but you know. That's how hey, things get started. That's right. If we start a rumor, maybe it'll come <laughs> true. I, I'm a firm believer in that. Put it out there. It'll happen. Yeah. But I think that would um, really help, like libraries, for example, if you would like to bring together, I know at Lexington they were hoping to start, um, and if you're out there, um, start a, a, a writer's group mm -hmm. at their library for anyone who wanted to join it. And I think it's a great way to get people into the library. You know, libraries are so um, much different than they were in our younger years. Our 
younger years. Right. A uh, lot more than books. Uh, you know, so getting people in their uh, community, creating community, I think is an awesome idea. And where schools have another agenda um, altogether, maybe they don't have the resources or the time to really pursue that. There might be a writer's group at, at school. But after school, school probably. It'd be an after school. Yeah. Um, we are seeing some very exciting things in high schools with this Louder Than a Bomb um, poet, slam poetry. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's taking off like wildfire. I think it's going to spread all across the state. And it's a very, it's a performance poetry thing and young people love it. And there's a ton of energy when you attend one of those events, isn't yeah, that? Yeah, it's just, very exciting. It is very exciting. You it's like, a, it's, it's and, a, I think it's a new wave of that kind of poetry which gets people engaged. And I know there are teachers and librarians in the in Lincoln <coughs> that I'm familiar with that are working on, mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. Lots of great students oh, yeah. doing great projects. And the comments, some of the comments are that these students may not have... Um, they kind of came out of the their shell or something, and they're out there. They're out there, and uh, which is very exciting that the teachers weren't expecting that from their students. But yeah, very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. I like that. And uh, well, so why is poetry important anyway? <laughs> I've been asked that question, um, yes. and I I've had to think about it. Well, you know, one of the questions I got was, well, why is poetry relevant today? You know, we're, we're all about social media, we're um, Instagram and tweets and, you know, everything has sped up. And poetry makes you slow down and contemplate. So when people go to a poetry reading, they love to be read to, but, you know, they may not pick up a book of poetry, but maybe they become engaged that way. And it is a form of slowing down and paying attention. Um, it's a great use of language, in my opinion. Um, it builds writing skills. If you study poetry, write poetry, you, uh, you have to say the most in the least amount of space. And I think that helps you with your writing skills. It opens people to the world of literature. If you read other poets, there's, you know, poets have been writing for a long time, and I don't think they're going away anytime soon. <laughs> um, I really believe that poetry helps you understand other people, uh, especially if you read your poetry to a group, for example, and helps you understand each other. The human experience is all there in poetry. So uh, that's why I think it's relevant. Don Welch uh, talked about that in his presentation at the Nebraska Book Festival recently. That's you were right. there. I was there. Did you have any experiences like he talked about? Now, his was as a result of being in a, working with a classroom. But. Right, and he did the Poets in the Schools yes. program through uh, Nebraska Arts Council, which um, is no longer in, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, but he went to a lot of schools. And yeah. what, you know, I love that, what he presented the, uh, um, recently was that he, he uh, highlighted like a grade school student, mm -hmm. a middle school student, a high school That's student, cool. Um, and those, he quoted them and, and told the stories. And that's, that's another thing poetry can do is tell stories. And so I like it in that respect. But um, Don Welch, you know, has been an educator for 50 years. Yes. And he has really done a great thing for Nebraska. We, can, we writers consider him to be one of the godfathers, <laughs> <laughs> the great writers of Nebraska. So... But yes, he he's done a wonderful job, and he, he it was a delight to hear his they stories. Were, I mean, they were very they were wonderful. humbling very. stories. And if, if you're interested in some of those stories, we do have those on the Nebraska Center for the Book Facebook page. We have a, a little video that uh, Rex took for uh, for us, and we put it up on the Facebook page, and it's just got one of these stories <clears throat> that he told during mm -hmm. his presentation. Mm -hmm. It's quite delightful. Yes. So you mentioned writer, writing in a group. Like, uh, for example, say a library wanted to start a writer's group, mm -hmm. um, either for adults or for school-aged yeah. people. 
depending on what they think the need is in their community or mm -hmm. the interest is. Have you ever been part of a writer's group yourself? Mm -hmm. How'd that work? Well, I'm in two writer's groups right now. Um, there's the Wesleyan Writer's Group, which I joined, I'm going to say, 30 years ago. Oh. Is Maybe. that sponsored by the college then? Or? No, it isn't. It's just a group. Yeah, yeah. It started 30 years, I, I can't remember. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been quite that long. Um, but almost, geez, um, time flies. Anyway, so it's been going on a long time. And, of course, we had one of our great Nebraska poet godfathers in there as one of the uh, members was Bill Clefcorn. And he was my first writing teacher, so that was very exciting to me to become a part of that writer's group. Um, and actually, after he and Leon Satterfield passed away in 2011, we stopped meeting for a whole year. <laughs> we didn't think we could go on. Um, but we carried on. And we meet once, well, now we meet uh, once every other month. And you bring, the rule is to bring something new that you've written. And it's, it's more than just Wesleyan personnel. Um, I haven't worked there for a long time, but um, it's loosely associated with Wesleyan. And it's a great way to try out new writing, um, to bounce something off of other people. That's the other thing, creating community. Um, try your work out on other people, you know. Unless you're Emily Dickinson and want to stick all of your poems in a drawer, you know, most <laughs> of us are trying to communicate with others. and see how the ideas work in our poems. So building trust is kind of important because you're going to be reading that work out loud to those folks yes. probably or yes. they're going to read it and, and talk about it. Yes, and give you we're feedback. going to discuss it. Although I must say that once you start writing poetry and send your work out, for example, or read it to a group, you have to develop a little bit of a thick skin mm -hmm. about your writing. If you're terribly sensitive about something, it's probably not ready for Prime time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too personal at this point. Too personal. But I'm, uh, the other writer's group I'm in is, is five women, and we call ourselves the Prairie Trout. And, <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of one of those exotic things. And uh, we have a lot of fun. It's a serious writing group, um, and we're all published um, authors, so it's, um, it's, um, it's more of a working uh, writer's group. And again, you meet regularly, Yes. share your work, we, we, get feedback. That's right. So um, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, the rule there is you bring anything you've written in the last month, but if you don't have anything, that's fine too. It's, mm -hmm. it's just more or less who's got some work to share. So if a librarian was thinking about they might like to start this kind of a group, mm -hmm. um, they would bring together people who are interested by getting the word out that people could come, mm -hmm. try and get them comfortable with each other, maybe give them a, a writing exercise yeah. to begin with, mm -hmm. and then just start suggesting they bring what they're working on. Right. That's a great way to get started. In fact, um, if you wanted to try that, have a prompt or some, everybody working on the same thing, and if it's spontaneous writing, it's, it can generate some very, very interesting work. Um, and then you do get comfortable. Everybody's working on the same thing. Everybody reads what they write. It, it helps you kind of get comfortable, like mm -hmm. you said. The mm -hmm. trust starts to build. So um, in a young person's writer's group, for example, they may not want their parents in it, for example. Uh -huh. <laughs> or it's in a small town. You know, everybody knows everybody. But... Um, yeah, that's a way to get started, and then it can build from there. You can say, well, like somebody might say, well, I'm working on this other thing that I'd kind of like to get your ideas on. So that's sometimes these things evolve, mm -hmm. and maybe that's the best way, just have it evolve organically. Maybe it'll just be a drop-in thing. Well, not everybody, the same group is there every week. That might work, too. So is there a source for, um, like, writing exercises? This would be something you could have on mm -hmm. your website once mm -hmm. you get going, and mm -hmm. people could share their responses to mm -hmm. it. But at this point, say a librarian's trying to start something mm -hmm. like this, is there a good source for them for that? Yeah, um, poets and writers, um, you get on their website. Um, they, have, they, they will send out every week uh, writing prompts for both poetry and fiction and nonfiction. And... They're, um, they're very well known, and I, uh, they have a magazine, Poets and Writers, um, 
but their online sources are really fabulous. I mean, they have they have well-known poets uh, are are profiled, and you can look up a poet a poem of Ted Coozer's, for example, on poets and writers, and they'll have several of his poems. You can just so another writing exercise I highly recommend is to read a poem, any poem, and then respond to it. <laughs> answer it, refute it, um, you know, write your own, use the title, write your own poem underneath it, use the language out of that poem, an idea in the poem, a notion, or an attitude, make your own poem. This is the easiest writing exercise on earth. So if you want to just start with somebody's poem and say it's, um, say it's one out of one of my books, then just write your own from it. Oh, that would be fun. Another fun thing to do in an interactive website, you could suggest one and have people start giving you theirs. You could even do that on Facebook, couldn't you? You could. Probably. You could. And so I, I often um, will read a poem and then I'll, um, in a writing group or a, in a workshop or something, and I'll say, okay, now, what would you write? Use your experience here or substitute your own language or where is it, will this go? That was one of the things I always thought about Twitter is that I, I don't understand why it hasn't evolved into something that poets use no. to communicate with each other in poetry. Because 140 characters. Exactly. <laughs> it forces you to use the right words if you, if you spend time on it. If you just dash something off, click, 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 right. not. Right. But if, you, if you, you did, it would be kind of a fun way for poets to communicate with each other. Right, exactly. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. <laughs> That's a big difference. <laughs> the right word. Use the right word. So poets are all about the right word. Yeah. Cool. Your book, uh, Dirt Signs, is one of my favorites. Thank you, you collaborated with uh, <laughs> Linda Hesselstrom from South Dakota. How did that come about, that, that the two of you worked together yeah, to publish I'm, that book? Okay, so Linda Hazel, she's Swedish, so it's Hazelstrom. Hazelstrom um, right. She's a rancher, writer from western South Dakota, southwestern, right outside the Black Hills, on the plains, beautiful area. Mm -hmm. And um, I met her at Nebraska Wesleyan. She came there as a speaker, and uh, we hit it off. I mean, uh, we have the same kind of farm ranch background, the rural background. Uh, we have the same kind of sensibilities. She's mostly a prose writer, but she's always written poetry. And she's actually published a book or two of poetry. But she makes her living as a writer, basically. And she has this beautiful ranch, um, two houses on the ranch. And one is the original ranch house. Wow. And that's where um, she she conducts writing uh, retreats for women. And uh, you can get on windbreakhouse.com. Windbreakhouse.com? Yeah. And she, you can negotiate with her to stay there, and she will help you with your writing. And so it, the uh, photo on the cover of the book That comes is from, from her, her ranch. Oh. And, oh, um, um, my husband took this photo when we were up there one time, but it reminded me so much of the hills in northeast Nebraska where I grew yeah. up yeah. On, the, on the farm. I'm going to try and get as close as I can to that. I'll try to hold it steady. Because it is so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And the cover, here, I'm going to hold it like this. <laughs> there we go. You can just see that just forever, sky yeah. and land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it kind of fades to denim on the back, which that was very deliberate. The, the um, artist did a great job. But um, anyway, yes, and so this book is a collection of 50 of her poems, Linda's, and 50 of mine. So it's really like, almost like two books mm -hmm. uh, in one. And um, it wasn't a collaboration in the sense that we negotiated which poems or wrote poems together or um, traded back and forth. It's just that we trusted each other to put um, some of our poems together in that kind of loose ranch and farm theme. But of course there's so much more than just that. Um, it's, it's a, I guess, a 
compilation of a lot of different attitudes here. And if you want, I'd read a poem out of Please here. Do. Yeah. Uh, this was called Work. And um, the epigraph comes from NPR News, which says, the honeybee can fly nearly five billion miles on one gallon of honey. I mean, talk about where do poems come from. <laughs> I heard that on NPR News, and I'm going, there's a poem. <laughs> so this is called work. On spring days, you could hear it, buzzing cloud back and forth between fence row and hives, over the rigosa roses and the field, 40 acres of clover with its billions of tiny blooms. My father grinned as he opened a, a top, brushed aside the bodies, pried out a frame oozing with sweetness, my hands on the extractor handle sticky with the great efficiency and substance of their labor. Worker bees, like my farmer father, combed those fields for a harvest of gold. Some years crop failure and bad luck weather affected supply and yield. All that labor translated into a meager existence, a tightening of the belts. Worker bees kick out the drones to protect their winter food. Back then, all we needed was whatever we raised, planted, butchered, and preserved. There were no guarantees. We took care of the land. The land took care of us. All honeybees need is pollen and nectar, an unspoiled spring-fed creek, the occasional gentle hand to encourage them on. Extremely timely in all we know about bees and right now, isn't That's it? That's right. That's right. Exactly right. So anything in your life, I think, I believe, is food for poetry. And so um, when I heard the, the NPR News little tidbit there, I thought, okay, I know a poem. And I could write about my dad keeping bees. And that experience, you know, is... Now, beekeepers are so much different. Everything is kind of industrialized. So um, hopefully, but the smaller farmers, the sustainable farms are, are keeping bees and, on their land, which yeah. we need bees. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. And that, again, is another Nebraska Book Award poetry. Winner. It is. Winner yeah, for poetry. 20, 2012? Is that right? 12. 2012. 2012. The book was published in 2011, I believe. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, it's... It's fun, and this was a fun project put together with Linda. It was back and forth negotiating about every little thing, but we were just so compatible. It was a lot of fun. Okay. I've actually collaborated with artists, um, art books, um, very limited production um, art books. Uh, Karen Kuntz, the printmaker from UNL, she now has a studio called Constellation Studio, um, the 21st and O in Lincoln. And um, she is a, a world famous printmaker. Um, it's just very exciting. We did. She did a wonderful print at Phil in Philadelphia when she was in residence there. And then I, she asked me for a poem, and so that was a great collaboration. And That's so, really cool. There's a, so I recommend another um, exercise is to go to an art museum and find something that speaks to you. There's a story in a painting or a sculpture or whatever. Um, John Janovey, who teaches, who is retired from the university, to, he taught biology, um, would regularly have his biology 101 students go to Sheldon Art Gallery, our museum, and just look at the paintings and write something. There's some kind of nature going on in some of these poems, and mm -hmm. he just wanted them to write about it, which mm -hmm. I thought was awesome. But writers can get inspiration from so many places. The Quilt Museum would be a great one to go to. A lot of uh, communities have art museums, like uh, Mona out at Kearney, um, Museum of Nebraska Art. Just That would be a great place for a writer's group to meet. It would. <laughs> yes, that would be a wonderful place. Or to take a field trip. 
field trip. From the Kearney Library. It's not that far. It's not that far. Yeah. That's right. So, there's poetry everywhere. Well, and I guess we just want to really encourage our listeners uh, to think about programs that they might want to sponsor that Tyla would be interested in hearing about, possibly be able to do. Um, I wanted to point out that if you go to the Nebraska Arts Council um, website, that this is kind of a long URL, but you can find it here. Um, this is uh, where they have the Twyla Hansen program, and it is Poetry, Reading, and Discussion. And then Twyla actually reads her original and accessible poems and discusses how the landscape of the Great Plains has inspired, influenced, and shaped her writing. And this is where you would find more about that particular program. And then the next address, Humanities Nebraska's address, um, this is the Humanities Nebraska Speer Speakers Bureau. And the name of the program is For the Love of Words, Poetry, Prose, and the Creative Writing Process. And again, this is a writing workshop. It's a, a writing workshop that focuses on the creative process for both po poetry and short prose. So these are the locations for more information on these things. Right. And again, um, you don't have to jot these down. This will all be on our website where mm -hmm. we keep this recorded archived to we do have a comment that yes, came in. Happen. Actually, um, Christine Walsh, who's the assistant director at the Kearney Public Library. Hi, Christine. Oh, is on with us. And <laughs> says, thanks for the plugs for Mona and the Kearney Public Library. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll have links to those that included as well. Yeah, on the Mona website absolutely. And, online as well. and then, Twyla, you've got some things coming up. Wow. I do. Um, I have um, a few things on the books right now. Um, I'm going to go to Kearney in September. Um, I'm doing, I'm presenting at the Senior College, which they do a little different than UNL. Uh, UNL has an OLLI program, and I uh, presented there this um, earlier this last month. Um, but I'm going out there to, um, they have like Senior College, which is like, a, I think it's several, like a month or a semester long. Oh, really? Kind of thing. Is and, it residential or are most of the people local? Um, I think most of the people are low probably. But anyway, so I'm giving a presentation with Dr. Charles Peak up there and an evening reading. Um, I'm sure it's at the college. And um, that's September 23rd. And then on September 27th, I'm going to the, the adult conference of the Plum Creek Literacy Festival. That's um, in Seward. And so I'm going to be giving a workshop up there. And um, I've also been contacted by the Nebraska Press Women Association. I think I'll be going to York for a presentation there. I'm not sure that's open to the public, but there's different things that come up. And if they're public, I will post them on my um, Facebook page. Oh, good. That's so, the best place to stay in touch. Yeah. And so you can get on to the Facebook page, and you can like it, which means you will follow and get the postings. So. That's a great way to stay in touch. Or you can contact me by email or by phone. Well, and, and <laughs> just to remind you, there are some other art, these, these articles that are available that you might want to learn more about what's going on with Twyla. But again, I do think that the best connection is your Facebook page right now. It is. And on Facebook, you can also send a message uh, privately, directly to me. And that's happened quite a few times. Mm -hmm. And then I can give it in my email. Gmail account if they have more extensive questions or they can even call me if they need to. So, so just a reminder, um, we are going to stay on for a little bit longer. So if anybody's got any questions, we want to be sure and get to them. You can type them into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Or if you have a microphone, you can just ask us to unmute your microphone and we'll actually talk to you person <laughs> to person. So, did you want me to close with a poem? Or did I do time? want you to close with a poem. And, sure. and, um, and you can close with more than one if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, had asked a question earlier about how you might incorporate some of your horticultural background. Obviously the bees, oh, yeah. but if there's anything else you want to talk about that, in terms of plants and okay. their uh, ability to inspire poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have one. It's called lettuce. 
<laughs> Lettuce. Not the most romantic of plants. Well, you know, the biggest challenge for a writer is to take a very common topic. Like I've written a, a poem about potatoes. So it was a call, actually a challenge, but, you know, take the most common thing and what can you possibly write about it that's new. That's a great challenge for a writer. People love it. Writers love challenges, especially poets. <laughs> okay, so this is called Lettuce. A luxury once reserved for nobility, so esteemed any Greek slave caught eating it was given 30 lashes. The emperor Augustus regularly ate it at the end of a meal. Later, Domitian would prefer it as an appetizer. Today, early, step out to your garden and simply harvest, gathering proof that nature is benign and generous. It's of the genus Lactuca, meaning milk, when cut, losing milk-like juices, a later mild cousin to the wild prickly native. Look under the leafy canopy where gnats and, mosqui and mosquitoes rest, where soil splatters upward from late night showers. The plants rise delicate and tender from their composted beds, greens, reds, sweet, buttery, smooth, broad, frilly. To eat leaf lettuce is to taste early summer, its pale colors, its temperatures, the earth, the air, the temporary rain. Mm -hmm. So that is a horticulture poem, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. It makes you wonder, how come lettuce would be a delicacy? I mean, I know because of the taste, but it grows so easily. It's it not does. like something that's hard to grow. No, but it's like so many foods um, when it was first discovered as a food. You know, it was unknown. Mm -hmm. It's unknown. It's like the tomato, which is a member of the net the deadly nightshade family. So you don't really want to eat the nightshade plant. Oh. And they thought it was poison. Mm -hmm. They were afraid, so they fed it to probably the people that worked for them first. <laughs> <laughs> the servants, <laughs> servant class, the, the servants, tasters. The tasters. <laughs> Here, taste this. <laughs> you don't die, but I'm going to eat it. <laughs> so, oh, but it's interesting. I'm interested in history and how things are the the story behind the story. And that makes for good poetry. There you go. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, you want to read a final poem for us? We've yeah. got time. Final, final, oh. final poem. I know. Well, it doesn't have to be final. <laughs> but at least for this hour. Closing. Okay. Closing. Closing. Thank you, Rod. Poetry. The right word. <laughs> the right word. Okay. Well, this one is a short poem. It came out, comes out of an experience I had for a few years as a writer in residence, um, going down the Oregon Trail with teachers um, out of Hastings College. Um, and at the end, we would climb the mountain in Wyoming. And so this is the title of this is On Medicine Bow Peak, Wyoming. And the epigraph says, USGS marker, 12,013 feet. On a clear day, you can see forever, almost, south to jagged peaks in Colorado, west and north to more Rockies and basins, east to the Laramie Range and beyond with a slow descent onto the plains. The ground below frost lines spread out like a geological feast, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, Underlying rocks revealing some of Earth's least known stories. The horizon playing tricks on your perceptions. Its witchery of light and shadow, of glittery glacier-carved lakes, snowfields and quartzite. The wind steady in your face. You in thin air, heavy, weighing heavy concepts of time and nature and what came before and what will after. So you sip, simply take it in, crunch and salt, and all your brain can grasp the grin of your buddy climbing, bringing you almost to tears. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, Carla. Yeah, thanks for asking me. It was fun. We've been talking with the Nebraska State Poet, Twyla Hansen. And uh, I guess one of the things we want to encourage everybody to do is to think about how poetry fits in with the programming and the activities that you're involved in and to contact Twyla if you have some ideas. Great. Thank you. Anything thank else for you. the good of the group? I think we're good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank all right. You everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Twyla, for being here with us and joining us this morning. This is great. Um, and Rod and Mary Jo for uh, hosting. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, the show has been recorded, as usual. And I think I captured all the different URLs and articles and websites that were mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> so they will be included um, in the show notes as well afterwards. There we go. All right. So that will wrap it up for uh, this morning's episode of Encompass Live. But... Um, and when the recording is available, probably later this afternoon, um, we'll let you know. And it'll um, be right here. Yes, it'll be here. This and location. Actually, where we go, right below here is where we have our archived Encompass Live sessions on our website. So you can go there for all of our um, recordings from previous shows. Um, so that will wrap it up for this morning. I hope you'll sign up and join us next week. And our topic is doing smart social media. So what's smart uh, social media? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll, we'll find, find out. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things out there, and people have been using them for a long time. Twitter. Uh -huh. You mentioned Twitter, and we've been showing off to Facebook. But what do you? How can you really do them well? And uh, do you need up? You know, think about it ahead of time. Don't just jump in, you know, head first and don't know what you're doing. This sounds really good. Who's doing um, it? Maurice Coleman, who is she, he hosts the T is for Training podcast. He's on the ALA Learning Roundtable, um, and he's a training. Um, he's also was a mover and shaker at, from Library Journal Mover and Shakers, um, and he's also the training. Um, what's his title here? Technical trainer at Hartford County Public Library in Maryland. And he goes around oh. the country doing these kinds of trainings. And he's going to be on the line with us to tell us how to do our social media really well and get things out there. I mean, you were mentioning, Twyla, that you use it and you think it's a great way to get people connected and doing things. Um, and so if you're, you've been doing it maybe and you want to know a little more, if you can do it better, or you just sort of think you've been thinking about it and your library is just you know, starting to get into it, um, Mo will be with us um, to tell us all about that next week. Cool. That sounds great. Yeah. And if you are on Facebook, yes, Encompass Live is on Facebook, too. <laughs> so you can um, go ahead and like our Facebook page there. We do post um, notices of when new sessions are coming. Um, I do reminders um, for the comp session that was just starting up this morning. I had a little post. And when our recordings are available, I post on here as well. Actually, it's somewhere below. Yeah. So that you can know when it's actually ready and up on our website. Cool. Other than that, that will wrap it up for this morning. Um, thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Krista. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.